Welcome to Middle School Science, Module 8, Earth and Space Science. This program is a partnership from TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. As we begin talking about the Earth's place in the universe, it's important to remember just how big the universe is. That the Earth is a very small planet in a very large universe. But that makes up how great we have to study and to learn about all the things around us. And it's important that we carry that sense of wonder into our classrooms. Let's begin talking about the characteristics of stars. Now, a star is an astronomical object consisting of a luminous spheroid of plasma held together by its own gravity. It's big enough that it holds itself in place. And the nearest star to Earth is, of course, the Sun, or Sol is what it's called. There are four major characteristics that we use to classify stars. First is just the stellar mass, the overall amount of mass inside the star. Second is its size. Uh, neutron stars are very, very concentrated, or only 25 miles wide, to supergiant stars, which are over, over 500 million miles across. Next would be surface temperature. The hotter a star, the more white its color appears. You know, you think about superheating metal, if you've seen a blacksmith, but as it starts to cool, it goes from white to blue to orange to red as it continues to cool down. And finally is luminosity, which is the amount of light and radiant energy emitted from the star. This is highly dependent on the stellar size and the surface temperature. As you can see, stars have a typical life cycle that's summarized by this diagram on the right-hand side. Stars are formed with clouds of gas and dust, start off as a stellar nebula. As they compress together, nuclear reactions at the core of this new star start to begin supplying energy that makes them emit huge amounts of energy. And then you split into two paths that really depend on just how big is the star. If it's an average star, something like the Sun, as it starts to use up its hydrogen fuel, it starts to expand and cool and becoming a red giant. Eventually, it loses so much compression and the energy falls back that it becomes a planetary nebula. Then the nebula collapses down to what we call a white dwarf and eventually a black dwarf as it loses the last of its power. Now, if it's a massive star, then you get what's a red supergiant. You have so much mass and so much energy that it ends up compressing again to a supernova. And that supernova can then become a neutron star, which is a very, very tightly compressed star, or a black hole, if it's large enough to have enough mass to support it. Now, a galaxy is a bound system of stars, stellar remnants, interstellar gas, dust, and dark matter that is all being gravitationally connected together. So galaxies are made up of stars. There are three major types of galaxies in our observable universe. Now, the one, the most common, is probably the spiral galaxy. This is a, it has a central bulge and a halo, a disk, and then spiral arms. Bright emission nebulae and hot young stars are present, especially in the spiral arms, showing that new star formation is occurring. And our own, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. Now you have elliptical galaxies, which is, consists almost entirely of old stars, because you can, they, they are now in the shape of a sphere or of an ellipsoid with no spiral arms because they aren't making any new stars. These are usually gigantic, but very little current activity. And then you have the irregular galaxies. It's kind of a catch-all term for a galaxy with no real shape. Uh, irregular galaxies usually have lower mass and luminosity than the spiral galaxies, and they appear very disorganized. So the large and small Magellanic clouds are irregular galaxies. Now, stars, obviously, we observe these from Earth. So to the naked eye, the stars appear fixed in the sky, that you look up in the sky, and depending on the Earth's rotation and the time of year, you see the skies. The, in the sky, you see the stars. But those stars are always in constant motion. The great distances to these stars mean that their apparent motions across the sky, the sky look very small in our lifetime. But since the stars are moving, the sky looks different now than when Galileo was observing them. And for instance, you can see this mock-up of the Big Dipper. Now, you recognize it on top there, but in 50,000 BC, 
it looks com almost very, it looks almost completely different. It looks more like a kite to me than a dipper. And that is all due to drift because the stars are always moving and our observation of them changes as well. Now to further complicate things, since the star may be moving toward or away from our vantage point, the light we receive from that star may have a shift. Now, if the star is moving towards Earth, you can see in the bottom right, we see a blue shift. So it starts shifting toward the blue side of the visible light spectrum. If it's moving away from Earth, then it's called a red shift. And if it's moving across our line of sight rather than at us, we, we see the light as it is. There's no shift at all. But this is how we can tell the relative speeds and velocities of objects that we observe. Now, the Big Bang Theory is the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it says the universe as we know started with an infinitely hot, infinitely dense singularity that then inflated, and first at just unimaginable speed, and then at a more measurable rate over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Since this is not something we can observe directly, much of our understanding of the Big Bang is based on mathematical models and formulas. We can, however, detect the echo of the expansion through a phenomenon known as the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMBR, which is radiation that can be detected through all of space that seems consistent through all of space and seems to indicate a common origin point that then expanded, leaving the CMBR behind. Now, specifically about Earth and our solar system, like other stars, the sun began as a massive cloud of gas and dust that began compressing under its own gravity, leading to the ignition of the nuclear reactions that fuel the sun to this day. Now, as the new star was burning off residual gas, there were smaller groupings of dust and gas that were large enough to generate gravity, but not large enough to form a star. These result in the gas giant planets that are far enough that the sun doesn't burn off all the lighter gases. The rocky inner planets additionally form from material coming together, but they have smaller atmospheres because that are close into their gravity well. The lighter materials get blown away by the solar wind. The exact mechanisms of our solar system's formation cannot be directly tested, but this is the generally accepted order of events. The large gravity well of the sun keeps the solar system objects in orbit and in general arrangement. The major components of our solar system and its heliosphere, that's the area of influence around the star where the solar wind is sweeping away the radiation. So we have the sun, which is a G-type yellow star. We have four rocky or terrestrial inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We have asteroids in a belt between Mars and Jupiter. This is the location of the dwarf planet Ceres and many others. We have four gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, as well as then trans-Newtonian objects. So we have dwarf planets like Pluto, Haumea, Eris, that are all outside of Neptune's orbit. And then we have comets and meteors running all throughout the solar system. And there's all sorts of smaller items that are running around all the time. Now, this is a simple not-to-scale diagram just showing where everything is located. So, as we said, you can see the four inner rocky planets that are relatively close together and relatively small. Then you've got the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You've got comets, and then you can see Pluto and uh, Eris and the Kuiper Belt objects, which are the extreme far out um, on the edge of the solar system objects. Now, in the Sun, Earth, and Moon, because we move in a predictable way in relation to the Sun and to the Moon, we can see certain effects on the Earth. Now, when the Moon is orbiting the Earth, the Moon's gravity has effects on the Earth, most commonly in tidal changes. As you can see in this diagram, when the oceans are directly between the Moon and the Earth, the water is being pulled between the Earth and the Moon, leading to a high tide where the water rushes to that place. Consequently, you end up with a low tide on the, one, on the sides that are, facing, uh, that are not facing the Moon. Since the Earth rotates every 24 hours, this cycle changes four times uh, each day around the Earth. 
So you have a high tide, then no tide, then low tide, then no tide. And it goes back and forth, back and forth. And those changes are just called tides or the tidal pattern. Another thing we can observe is since the moon orbits the Earth every 29 days or so, the moon looks different from Earth depending on its position relative to the sun at any given time. So you can see the sunlight is coming in from the right and then the Earth is in the center. When the moon is uh, between us and the sun, the sun is on the back side of the moon and we see the dark side. Because of this, we appear to see the new moon. When the moon's on the opposite side of the Earth, it's in the full light of the sun, so we say it's a full moon. It moves in that way because the lighting of the moon, after all, is sunlight. Because that's sunlight reflecting off the moon's surface relative to Earth. And then again, since all illumination in the solar system ultimately comes from the sun, darkness exists at any time that the sun's light is blocked or restricted. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon's orbit carries it between the sun and the earth, casting a shadow. As you can see here, a solar eclipse ends up with a very small area of umbra, where the sun is completely blocked out, and then a wider area of penumbra, which is a partial blocking of the sun. Now a lunar eclipse is the opposite scenario. When the earth comes between the moon and the sun, casting a shadow over the moon. So you can see here the umbra is much wider because the earth is wider than the moon. So it can cover the entire moon and have fully half the earth see at least a partial lunar eclipse. The penumbra spreads even further out because, again, the earth casts a much longer shadow. And the Earth is not rotating perfectly up and down. It has a tilt of about 23 degrees. As you can see, it's in an axial tilt. And you've seen this in probably very many globes that you, that you have around your house. They usually have this tilt. The result of this tilt is that some of the year, you can see the sun in the middle, in the December solstice, the northern half is further away from the sun than the southern half of the Earth. So this is winter in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere. And then the June solstice is the exact opposite, where the northern hemisphere is closer to the sun and the southern hemisphere is further away. This results in what we observe as seasons. Without the axial tilt, we would have basically the same weather everywhere all the time. And because living creatures need these cycles to survive, to have growing seasons and uh, reproductive processes, you know, Earth may not have any life on it if it didn't have this tilt. And that completes Middle School Science Module 8. Congratulations! Module 9 will cover the history of the planet Earth. Thank you very much.